our speaker this afternoon certainly has earned his crust today. So today was the day we were um, honoured to uh, see the award of an honorary doctorate to Professor Vikram Patel from the University of York, which is a great honour for us to, um, to have such an esteemed person upon which we can bestow such an honour. So, um, and I just want to say a few words before we hear from Vikram. So um, I have never in my lifetime um, been aware of mental health being part of the national conversation in the way in which it is just at the moment. And there is a phrase that I keep on seeing, I see it on policy documents, I see it in papers, and that is that there is no health without mental health. And um, I always wondered where that came from. You know, was it some policy wonk that had invented it in Whitehall and, you know, come up with a catchy phrase? So I took the trouble to um, visit the University of Google and um, put those words in and um, pressed return. And blow me, those words were written over 80 years ago by Dr. Brock Chisholm, who was the first Director General of the World Health Organization, who himself was a psychiatrist. And one of the enduring legacies of Dr. Chisholm is that um, he fought very hard to ensure that mental health would always be on the same page as physical health. And I think it's that, um, that mission um, that um, Brock Chisholm says us that has very much informed how we've thought about mental health here in the University of York and at the whole York Medical School. And ensuring that mental health and physical health are on the same page is um, the right thing to do. And um, in doing so, I feel that we have a co-conspirator in Professor Vikram Patel. So, um, and I know that he... Um, 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 I could spend the next 45 minutes talking about all the garlands and prizes that Vikram has had. You know, he is the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health at Harvard, but he's also a very wise and very thoughtful man and a great speaker. So I'm really excited and honoured to be able to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Vikram Patel. So welcome, Vikram. Oh, well, thank you so much, Simon. Uh, and it's really, really a huge privilege to be um, being awarded the honorary doctorate a few, uh, well, about an hour ago. Uh, it's one of those most cherished memories of my professional career. And thank you so much for coming here this afternoon rather than heading to the swimming pool, which is certainly, if I wasn't uh, uh, required to be here with you, is where I'd be. So I, I you know, I, I want to start by just acknowledging, uh, you know, uh, the, the the cataclysmic effect of these last two years. I, I think any conversation about mental health has to begin with what's happened over the last two years, and um, it's certainly been for me personally a cataclysmic event in terms of the amount of loss that I've experienced, uh, the amount of uh, the number of people that I loved who are no longer with us today, um, but. It's also been a cataclysmic event for many populations around the world, uh, certainly uh, the populations I know best, which is in the US and India. Uh, the, the effect of the pandemic in the last two years, particularly amongst those who are already very disadvantaged and marginalized in various ways, uh, has been quite, quite, uh, quite appalling, really, in terms of their loss of livelihoods, loss of life. Uh, and of course, the impact that that's had on their mental health has become increasingly apparent. But while much of this impact has been you know, really framed, as I just did, in, in these negative ways, uh, the honest truth is there's also been some very important positive outcomes, um, unexpectedly. Uh, and what might be those positive outcomes? For me, for example, I have observed suddenly the great conversation that's going on in our societies about the importance of social connectedness, about the importance of trust, trust between peoples in the population, but also between uh, populations and their governments. These are conversations that were not happening actually before the pandemic. Another very important recognition, particularly in India, for example, uh, indeed both India and the US, which is quite curious, these are two very different countries uh, in terms of their development status, but they share so much in common uh, in terms of, for example, the lack of universal health coverage uh, for their populations. And suddenly there's a, there's a lively conversation about universal health coverage. And by that I mean a health system that reaches everyone in the population, founded on principles of equity, evidence, uh, and population impact, but also importantly that recognizes the central role of the state, the government, as a steward of, of the healthcare system, not always necessarily as a provider of healthcare, but certainly as a steward and a financier of the healthcare system. And going to the subject of my particular conversation with you here today, is the recognition of mental health and well-being uh, as an inseparable component of sustainable development, not just of health, but of sustainable development. Thank you, Rachel. Now, in my reckoning, 
in these last two years, I've been working in the sector for you know, the better part of three decades. Uh, in my reckoning, I don't recall ever the subject of mental health being so much in the spotlight, not just of policymakers, but also at the level of civil society and the media, and also the issue of mental health being discussed in such a sensitive manner as in the last two years. And for me, it, it, it strikes me that this is truly a historic opportunity. For those of us who spend the last many decades complaining about the fact that mental health has never been an important subject, even though it should be, this seems like a historic opportunity for us to grasp before mental health is pushed back into the shadows by some other new crisis. Now, while much has been written about the impact uh, of the pandemic on mental health, let me, let me make one very important statement. There was a crisis in terms of mental health globally well before the pandemic. Now, many of us wonder what, what kind of metrics might be used to describe the crisis. There are many different kinds of metrics. One of them that's very popular is to refer to epidemiological metrics. How common are mental health problems, substance use problems, mortality associated with mental health? And certainly, if we use those metrics, there is robust evidence, particularly from those countries in which we have good quality longitudinal data, that every single metric on the prevalence of these problems and of mental health related mortality, they were getting worse over the two decades prior to the pandemic. As one example, in the US, opioid related mortality, uh, that is to say opioid overdoses and other opioid dependence related mortality, has been rising so dramatically before the pandemic that actually the life expectancy of working age Americans, particularly white working age Americans, has actually fallen, completely bucking the trend of increasing life expectancy in all other countries uh, before the pandemic. Or to take another example, suicide mortality in India uh, is now the single most important cause of death in young Indians. In fact, it's been the single most important cause of death in South Asia for young South Asians for the last 20 years, and it's been showing an uptick. Indeed, suicide mortality in young people has been rising in this country as well, uh, alongside those uh, in the US. The Global Burden of Disease study that was published a few months ago in The Lancet suggests that the pandemic has only added more fuel to the fire that existed before. But the crisis I really am referring to is not as is sometimes sensationally described as an epidemic of mental health problems. I don't think there's an epidemic. Actually, this problem has been around for decades, as I just illustrated. But the crisis I'm really referring to is one that Tom Insel, the former head of the NIMH, uh, the biggest mental health research funding body in the world. Tom Insel is a neuroscientist. He's also a psychiatrist and devoted much of his career as the head of NIMH funding billions of dollars of biological research. But in his book, Healing, which is a little bit of a mea culpa, really, uh, and a terrific book, in fact, focused on the US, he describes how every single metric reflecting the mental health of the US population has worsened. Not just the prevalence that I just referred to, but for example, the numbers of people with mental illness incarcerated in prison, the numbers of people who are homeless and who are also living with a mental health problem, and so on and so forth. Every single metric has worsened despite, despite the US spending more on mental health care per capita than any other health condition. Now, this is something most people don't actually know, which is that contrary to the usual belief system that countries, rich countries, aren't spending on mental health and we need more money. Actually, the US spends more on mental health care than it does on cancer care. The US spends more money on mental health research than virtually any other country in the world. Under Tom's watch, more than $20 billion of uh, money was spent on mental health research in just a short span of about 10 years. Much of this research, of course, was backing biological research on mental illness. The US has more mental health human resources per capita than any other country in the world. There are more mental health professionals in the city of New York than in the whole continent of Africa. And so in spite of all of this, every single metric reflecting mental health in the US population has worsened. And important to say, this is contrary to every other health area. During the same period, cancer mortality has fallen. Cardiovascular mortality has fallen. Discoveries of new drugs, miraculous new treatments for cancer, heart disease, and a variety of other uh, physical health conditions has actually transformed the landscape uh, for those conditions. However, 
Over the same period of time, despite all the spending, not only has every metric worsened, but we have precious little to show for all the research money that's gone into mental health research. So the crisis that I'm referring to is not a crisis of the lack of money. It's not a crisis of the lack of political will. But it is a crisis almost of the fundamental assumptions that have underwritten the way we have tried to understand and then respond to mental health problems over the last 50 years. Indeed, for most people, including people who have embraced the last 50 years as being the foundation of psychiatry and mental health, people are beginning to question this very assumption, set of assumptions. Now, my own personal journey in questioning these assumptions began actually a long time ago in a very unlikely way. Uh, back in 1993, I just completed my psychiatric training at the Maudsley Hospital in South London, uh, really the mecca of psychiatry at that time, and also the epicenter uh, of biological psychiatry at that time. And so fresh from uh, that psychiatric training, I found myself in Harare, Zimbabwe, really largely out of a wanderlust. Uh, but I found myself suddenly in a completely different context that I was very unprepared for. Admittedly, I knew it was a different context. I'd gone to SOAS in, in London and done a course in medical anthropology to prepare myself for this very different cultural and social context. But what I really found myself was in a context in which every single thing I had learned seemed completely irrelevant. In what way? First of all, I found myself as one of nine psychiatrists in a country of approximately nine million people. You can do the math, there's one psychiatrist per million but eight of us lived and worked in the city of Harare, the capital city, which effectively meant there was one psychiatrist for seven million people in the rest of the country. There were more psychiatrists in my corridor in the Institute of Psychiatry that I shared with Rachel Churchill than there were in the whole of Zimbabwe at the time that I arrived there. But not only was this a question of the lack of psychiatrists, there was also the question of when people consult a psychiatrist, why they did so. Most people came to my clinic under duress. Very, very few, vanishingly small proportion of people actually came voluntarily. In part, of course, that was because um, there weren't enough of us, and we were all concentrated in the capital city, a long way away from where most people lived. But also, it was because of the care that psychiatry provided. And this was true not only of Harare, it was true of all of Africa, all of Asia, and most of Latin America. That care comprised colonial era mental hospitals. In fact, the, the psychiatric inpatient unit I worked in was a progressive one because it wasn't in a mental hospital. It was in fact so-called with a general hospital, except that it wasn't. It was in a separate compound from the general hospital, far away from where other health conditions were treated. And importantly, it was surrounded by a barbed wire fence that wasn't in fact what the general hospital was surrounded by. If you were brought to a psychiatric care institution in any of these countries, the likelihood was, first of all, you'd be brought by the police. You'd be brought in a straitjacket, in a police van, not in an ambulance. You'd be brought under a magistrate's order that essentially stripped you of all your rights. You'd then be consigned to an institution where you'd be locked behind a, 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 a barred gate or barbed wire. And you'd then be stripped of your clothing. You'd have to wear what looked like a prison uniform. And basically, somebody will throw away the key. You might remain there for months, if not years. You'd be doped up to your eyeballs. And when you were finally allowed to go um, by some kind of judicial diktat, uh, the chances are you'd have no follow-up care. And so, of course, if you had a chronic enduring mental illness, the odds were sometime in the future you will land up back in that particular institution. In Harare, my ward was uh, half-jokingly, half-seriously called the zoo. So if this was the kind of care that was associated with mental health care, you can quickly imagine why nobody would seek mental health care and why there'd be a lot of stigma attached to mental health care. I often tell my colleagues who work in the area of stigma, you know, who want to change the hearts and minds of people, imagine for a moment if this is what happened to you if you had breast cancer. A police van turned up at your door, put you in a straitjacket, bundled you, into, uh, bundled you into, the, in, into the back of the van uh, and took you off to a ward where you were going to be locked in and then sedated for the rest of your life. So I had, to, I had to unlearn almost everything that I had learned in psychiatry in London, before that in Oxford, and then in Mumbai, big city hospitals, very well resourced. I had to sort of reimagine how I would in fact address 
uh, mental health problems in this extremely different setting where there were both enormous supply side barriers but also enormous demand side barriers. And I took to actually being inspired by other fields outside psychiatry. The most important of those was global health. Global health at the time was just beginning its renaissance, and that renaissance was happening around the issue of HIV AIDS. Back in the mid-90s, most people who died on my psychiatric ward died not of mental illness, they actually died of HIV AIDS, which at the time, of course, already had uh, a curative treatment. Um, Whereas people in the West, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this story, whereas people in the West were no longer dying of AIDS because they had a cocktail of antiretroviral drugs, in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and most of Latin America, people were dying by the millions. And of course, the reason then uh, was that uh, the drug companies refused to drop the prices. There was this whole uh, you know, um, assumption that health systems in Africa and Asia couldn't really uh, deal with long-term antiretroviral therapy for a variety of reasons. Most of it, of course, we know in hindsight was because uh, these countries demanded a reduction and a removal of the patent protection of these drugs. What I learned from global health was the importance of activism, the importance of a human rights-based perspective to healthcare, the importance of the lived experience, because, of course, all of this was being led by people living with HIV AIDS to transform policy and practice. And of course, what that led to was a dramatic change in the landscape of access to good quality care, not only by making these drugs available at no cost to people around the world, but importantly by making them available through decentralized healthcare systems and through the empowerment of community health workers to mobilize people with HIV AIDS to come to care and support them uh, in the care process. I turn also to lessons from other disciplines such as medical anthropology. The work of Arthur Klein was particularly informative, uh, uh, inspiring for me. He taught me the importance of the illness narrative, to understand how people themselves explain their suffering, how that motivates them to seek care, from what kinds of care providers, and what we can learn from that in the way that we can organize and design a care system to be person-centered. I learned from the work of traditional healers like Tarisai Musara, a long-standing long collaborator of mine who was the head of Zimbabwe's uh, Traditional Healer Association. In Zimbabwe, the, the rich history of traditional healers had also led to their professionalization with support from the government. I learned from Tarisai and his colleagues, traditional healers, how important it was to have the family involved in the care process, how important it was to have symbols of rituals uh, that were deeply imbued with cultural meaning, and how important it was to address not only to psychological needs, but also to spiritual needs. I learned from social scientists like George Brown uh, in South London uh, and John Weiss in, in Harvard the importance of addressing people's social needs as well as their psychological needs through simple interventions that empowered people with the skills to address uh, these needs. I learned from Tom Insel, a neuroscientist, how we needed to re-characterize mental illnesses so that we really reflected the neuroscience that was telling us that mental illnesses really represented dimensions of human experience that all of us experience at some points in our life in completely normative and adaptive ways. I have assembled all of this wealth of personal experience, the empirical evidence that I myself have generated, the things I've read and learned from others. And today what I want to do is to suggest to you how we might actually reframe mental health in ways that can actually shift the needle on the global burden on mental illness. I want to start by suggesting to you why I think we have a crisis uh, in, 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 in the global mental health context. For me, the overarching reason has been for the past 50 years, we have adopted a very narrow biomedical framing of mental health. Essentially, let's be honest, when you ever hear the word mental health, the first thing you think about is actually anything but mental health. Mostly, you think about mental illness. Now, while this particular model that we adopted about 70 years ago was adopted for very good reason at the time, and I'll speak to that in a moment, it's a model that works so very well for infectious diseases where you can neatly partition the world into people with and without an infectious disease. We now realize, with the benefit of hindsight, it has to be said, that this was a completely inadequate way of thinking about a far more complex human experience, which is integral, completely integral, to each of our life stories. There were, of course, structural flaws to this approach right from the outset, and that flaw was that 
the classification of mental illnesses was not based on some verifiable pathological test or some verifiable radiology or independent objective biomarker. It, would, it was based entirely on the observations that psychiatrists were making on the patterns of symptoms that people presented with. But the structural flaw was really this. Those psychiatrists were all white, working in a few academic settings in North America and, well, mainly in Britain and North America. Therefore, their observations represented less than 1% of what psychiatric morbidity actually looks like in the population. Both because 95% of the world's population that live in low- and middle-income countries was excluded from these observations, but also within high-income countries, only a minority of people with mental health problems ever got to these psychiatric clinics. Nonetheless, it has to be granted that th there was a, a genuine belief by, our, uh, by, by the architects of the system that by characterizing these diagnostic clusters, that research would ultimately identify the biological heart of each of these disorders, just in the same way as that there was a biological heart to various cancers or heart disease. Ultimately, they felt that by identifying the biological mechanisms of these different conditions, we will come up with biological treatments for each of these conditions. I believe this was a well-founded uh, well assumption, and it, of course, it's easy, easy to critique in hindsight, uh, but I don't believe that this journey was a wasted one. In fact, I think it was an extremely important journey because at the end of 50 years and billions and billions of dollars of spending later, we can, we can conclude that this assumption was fundamentally incorrect. We neither have a single biomarker for any of the hundreds of psychiatric diagnoses in the various classification systems, nor has this classification system and all the research that has followed led to the discovery of any new transformative preventive or treatment intervention. Much of what we still do in mental health care today was known in spite of and before this classification system came into place. So the reasons why this biomedical framing has failed to shift the needle is because we have had an overwhelming emphasis on narrowly defined clinical interventions. By clinical interventions, we mean mostly drugs. Even though psychological treatments have known to be as effective, in fact, even more effective for most mental health conditions, 90% of the time when a person receives an intervention for their mental health problem, it's likely to be a medication. And of course, there's virtually no attention to social determinants that so frequently co-occur with mental health problems. By focusing on diagnostic clusters that are typically visible in adults, we miss the unique opportunities of early intervention earlier in the life course, despite us knowing that mental illnesses typically begin in young adulthood or even earlier. The emphasis on diagnosis and medication privileges one group of practitioners over all others, and those are psychiatrists. Because only psychiatrists can prescribe, and the diagnostic system is so darn complicated that only psychiatrists can, in fact, apply this because this is the heart of their training. And because psychiatrists are so few in low- and middle-income countries, and even where they do exist, they largely work in big cities and in the private sector, it means the vast majority of the world's population has no access to mental health care. And finally, through the privileging of mental health professionals over all other groups in society who could be engaged with mental health care, we've effectively vested in power in this group, which of course will then allocate resources disproportionately to that kind of biomedical mental health care, uh, disempowering and under-resourcing all other opportunities for care. This supply side challenge, as I've already mentioned, is further amplified by the demand side challenge. Most people in the world do not want to seek mental health care from mental health professionals, because of the history of mental health care that I've already alluded to, a history that is really imbued with incarceration, with violence, with sedation and coercion. And here I speak mostly about the developing world. I know in the UK there has been a huge transformation in the last 50 years, and I'm really speaking from the global context here. But also because mental health professionals are very expensive, they're hard to access, and they speak a language that is very foreign from the lived experience. Most people interpret the lived experience of mental health and illness not in a biological way. They do it either through a social or spiritual lens. So let me turn to where I think the future lies. 
For a long time, we've been the butt of jokes from other, uh, other fields of medicine that we know nothing, uh, uh, we do nothing uh, for our patients. Um, and this is, of course, I believe, completely untrue. Despite the growing nihilism and pessimism that the field of mental health has neither the knowledge nor the interventions to shift the needle, I believe, in fact, the truth is exactly the opposite. But we've been looking completely in the wrong direction. Over the last five years, I've had the good fortune of working with scientists and practitioners from around the world for three different uh, evidence synthesis um, efforts, which have really tried to understand how, uh, where the science really lies that can help us identify a reimagined path to recovery. I put together the Lancet Commission on Global Mental and Sustainable Development in 2018. The Lancet World Psychiatric Association Commission on Depression that was published earlier this year. And for the World Bank, the Disease Control Priorities Program uh, a few years ago. And what I want to do now in the uh, latter part of my talk is to just propose to you three specific directions of travel that I believe offer us opportunities to transform mental health, to move the narrative beyond a narrow biomedical framing. First, I want to draw on the robust, consistent, cross-national evidence on the inequitable distribution of mental health problems. What this tells us more than anything else, it is the strongest proof we have of the importance of social determinants in leading to mental health problems. Not only leading to mental health problems, the emergence of mental health problems, but also their perpetuation. A lot of my early work in Zimbabwe and India actually focused on this, and I think one of my earliest papers that caught the attention of, 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 of people, for example, at the World Bank, uh, was, was a paper in which I positioned the word poverty alongside mental health. Because poverty was considered to be an extremely important mother of all diseases, and it was important for me to actually make the case that we, did, we shouldn't be um, uh, you know, obscuring the fact that when we do these epidemiological studies, what we're really referring to when we talk about, for example, low education as a risk factor for poor mental health, what we're really talking about ultimately is the impact of poverty through various mechanisms on population mental health. Social determinants are at the heart of explaining why people who are already marginalized and living on the fringes of society, for example, low-income groups, sexual minority groups, people who've been displaced by trauma and conflict, why they bear a disproportionate burden of mental health problems. Adversities in one's social world not only leads to an increased risk, but as I said, they also perpetuate these mental health problems. And it is these risk factors that have been fueled in the last 20 years by a variety of different forces, not least climate change and, of course, the pandemic. But in addition to the increase in risk factors, there's also been the very different mechanism of the erosion of protective factors. Now, a lot of people have been writing about why we see a dramatic rise in hateful polarization in societies around the world. But what is clear, whatever, regardless of what the reasons for the rise in hateful polarization is, which is evident in almost every country in the world right now, uh, what it surely does is it actually attacks the social connectedness and social capital of our communities, which in itself is an erosion of protective factors. One of the key reasons, I believe anyway, and, and certainly this is work that I read of sociologists and economists, um, is that the loss of trust in one another, the loss of trust in state institutions, is being fueled heavily by the toxic increase in inequalities, wealth and income inequalities, in every country of the world. So what's the practical implication of this? From a practical coalface implication, what this means is that one can never, ever silo a clinical intervention from a social one. It is a falsehood that somehow social interventions are not, not a clinical one because it is like treating half the problem. How can you, for example, treat someone's heart disease without also addressing their lifestyles and their diet? In the same way, how can you possibly treat someone's mental health problem without addressing the intimate partner violence that they might be experiencing, the housing difficulties that they might be experiencing, the difficulties in putting food on the table because of the lack of income or the loneliness that they're experiencing? These social determinants are not intractable. Sometimes we kind of feel a little overwhelmed by the thought, oh my goodness, this guy's saying, you know what, we're going to have to change, we're going to have all big politicians. Not at all. Of course, some of us should be politicians if we really believe in this, but we can do a lot without being politicians. For example, my colleagues in Brazil have shown how the Bolsa Familia program, the largest cash transfer program in the world, 
that benefits 100 million Brazilians has led to dramatic reductions in suicide mortality and a massive reduction in disparities between black and white Brazilians in a range of mental health outcomes, such as, for example, suicide and psychiatric hospitalization. To quote Tom Insel again, what most people with mental health problems want and need relates to three things, people, place, and purpose, and I'll quote him. That is connecting with other people, living in a place which they can call home, and having a meaningful purpose in life. In the US, for example, Housing First is a great example of a community campaign that has linked mental health care with secure housing and demonstrated not only how effective it is, but you know, because many people say, do we have the money, how cost effective it is in terms of reducing overall costs by reducing psychiatric hospitalization in individuals who have secure housing. Second, my second observation. The second observation is one I'm very passionate about as well. It's one which goes back to the founding days of psychiatry. And it relates to Freud's observation, a very powerful one, that the mental health problems that he was witnessing in his adult patients seemed to have their origins early in their childhood. I consider this one of psychiatry's Newtonian moments because it's an observation whose mechanism Freud got completely wrong so the, the explanation he made for this observation has been discarded, but the observation itself has stood the test of time. Today, there is no doubt that from the individual life course perspective, the single most powerful, consistently demonstrated risk factor for poor mental health in adult life is what happened to you when you were three, four, five, and seven years old. Especially the first decade, but also now the second decade of life. This has been demonstrated in every single society of the world. There's a dose-response relationship that, of course, adds weight to the causality uh, explanation. And importantly, we now have a clear developmental mechanism to explain it. Recent discoveries in brain, about brain plasticity and differential maturation of the brain in adolescence provide a coherent biological mechanism to explain how adversities in social environments early in life lead to mental health problems later in life. What's the key implication of this? The key implication of this extremely important foundational observation uh, that comes primarily actually from developmental science is that prevention is possible. We do have the equivalent of tobacco in the mental health field, and that lies in manipulating environments early in life, and those environments do change as a child grows up. They change from the home environment, responsive parenting at home, to school environments when you're in school, to neighborhood environments. And there is robust evidence for each of these different environments collating these, in, these, these interventions across the life course provide the most powerful opportunity to prevent the emergence of mental health problems in adulthood. Turning again to my own work, a few years ago, um, after spending about 20 years working in schools trying to figure out how one could change a social environment, we, we, we cotton on to a number of different key ingredients or principles, of course the most important being co-production of an intervention with adolescents, uh, creating an intervention that gave agency to adolescents that focused on peer relations to change the social environment. We ran a large randomized controlled trial in Bihar, the poorest state in India, where more than 70% of our secondary school students were first in their family to go to school. And we demonstrated how a student-led intervention that targeted the social environment and was facilitated by a lay counselor from the neighboring rural areas, the neighboring villages, dramatically led to a reduction in interpersonal violence, improved mental health, and improved school climate, which was the primary target of the intervention. The final observation is the demonstration of the effectiveness of interventions that target psychological or social skills in the individual. Well, oh, I club these together uh, into the broad rubric of psychosocial skills. The effectiveness of psychosocial interventions has been known for decades. In fact, if you look at NICE, the NICE guidelines, or you look at the World Health Organization guidelines, you'll be amazed to see that psychosocial interventions are recommended as the first-line intervention for almost every mood, anxiety, and trauma-related condition, which put together accounts for 70% of the global burden of mental health problems. And even for those conditions in which 
Pharmacology plays a very, very important role, like for example it does for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Psychosocial interventions greatly improve the outcomes as an adjunctive intervention. Put simply, almost everyone with a mental health problem can benefit from a psychosocial intervention. And yet, the I irony is that only a minuscule fraction of people in the world can access quality psychosocial interventions. To me, this is not a crisis of knowledge. We actually do know something that works. This is a crisis of delivery. Now, one of the great uh, uh, challenges in delivery has been, of course, as I mentioned earlier, this very narrow biomedical framing here. And by biomedical framing, I don't only mean psychiatrists. I also include my colleagues uh, in clinical psychology, the, 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 the profession that has really harnessed the science uh, that led to these interventions, but also tightly controls uh, who can actually deliver these interventions. And these, inter and both, like psychiatrists, psychologists are also very few in number uh, and, and, and inequitably distributed in, 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 in most parts of the world. In fact, in many parts of the world, there are even fewer psychologists than there are psychiatrists. So a lot of my recent work over the last 10 years, and in fact, the ho a whole lot of work in global mental health as, 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 a, as a discipline in the last 10 years, has really focused on building on the clinical science of the effectiveness of psychosocial interventions and then designing interventions that have two important properties. First, that they can be delivered by people who are not mental health professionals, such as, for example, community health workers, nurses, peer support workers, people who are more plentiful in the community and live and work in the communities that they were actually trained in. And the second, that they're acceptable to the people with mental health problems. And by this, I mean they address the illness narratives that I referred to earlier that are often such a huge barrier to people seeking mental health care. Friends, a few months ago, the Cochrane uh, Collaboration published uh, an update of a systematic review that I had mentored a, a few years ago, uh, led by Nadia Van Kinneken. She and her team were able to put together more than 100 randomized control trials. 100 randomized control trials. The number is growing exponentially. All of these hundred were published in the last decade, funded by uh, a consortium of funders, including the Wellcome Trust, the NIH, and others. And they all tell one clear story. Across the full range of mental health problems, this approach, which is called DAS sharing, the devolution of the delivery of evidence-based health interventions to non-physicians, is an effective, safe, and acceptable strategy across the full range of mental health conditions and an incredible diversity of contexts around the world. Now, many people have asked me, Vikram, you know, the star sharing approach, is it a kind of a dumb down approach? Is it a dumbing down of mental health care? Um, uh, and are we shortchanging people uh, who, uh, who should really be seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist? Well, there are very few head-to-head -head comparisons, as you might imagine. Uh, comparing DAS sharing uh, with a community health worker with psychiatrists because no IRB would in fact approve it. But the great news is one of the largest such trials in the world is in fact in progress right now and unbelievably it's not in a developing country. It's actually happening in the US and Canada. The largest DAS sharing trial that head-to-head -head compares a non-specialist with a specialist has just completed recruiting 800 women with postnatal depression and its target of 1,200 women, making it one of the largest psychotherapy trials in the world, uh, will soon be completed uh, in, in the coming year. And my belief is that we will find that there, in fact, is no difference. But for most countries in the world, for most populations in the world, this is a completely hypothetical question because there are no mental health professionals. And I will say this, that I, I also think that when people receive care from someone they identify with, and honestly, most people do not identify with highly skilled uh, practitioners working in big hospitals. When they, they, they identify much more with people who look like them, who speak the same language, who live in the same community, it invokes social connectedness and trust, it builds empathy, and it really is a very powerful uh, ingredient of the therapeutic alliance that we all acknowledge is a key to the recovery process. Furthermore, I can't think of anything less stigmatizing than receiving mental health care integrated with physical health care and delivered at your doorstep by a community health worker. We've also documented how this kind of approach benefits the provider. And almost every single study that has actually tried to ask providers who are involved in this kind of task sharing, many of them in my own work are lay people, but in many parts of the world are community health workers, we ask them, 
What's been your experience of delivering this psychological treatment for people with depression in your community? And without exception, the experience has been one of empowerment, a sense of fulfillment of a purpose in the community, and meeting a need that they always saw but could do nothing about in their, in their populations. Friends, by delivering interventions through widely available human resources, we do something really quite remarkable. We flip the narrative, the narrative we hear so often, a nihilistic narrative that we do not have enough resources, to a narrative that completely changes to how do we use the resources every community has, people who care for each other, into being involved in mental health care. And indeed, this is already being done in other areas of care delivery. By delivering interventions in community settings, even people's own homes, as we do for TB care, and extending that for mental health care, we realize the goal of meeting people where they are. This, of course, means that they no longer have to travel long distances to hospitals, and this artificially created barrier of non-adherence is addressed by actually taking health care to people's own homes, and recognizing the challenges, particularly for serious mental illness, that people experience in, in a, attending appointments at a particular hour, in a particular place, especially when they have no transportation of their own. By providing structured opportunities for people with a lived experience to become involved in peer support interventions, we realize the goal of empowering people with a lived experience to become active actors in the mental health care delivery process. And we also simultaneously realize the goal of reducing coercion in mental health care. How is that? Because you're more likely to make a decision around the, the care you receive if you're supported in doing that by somebody else with a lived experience than by a policeman or by a magistrate. And in, I'll tell you what, psychiatrists fit into the same category in the eyes of many people with serious mental illness. By offering low intensity care when people need it, rather than waiting for them to develop a full-blown full crisis, we realize the goal of early intervention. So the key paradigm shift here is that mental health care systems must change the way they allocate resources to build a community-based foundation of care, not as a separate silo from the mental health care system, but as an expansion of the footprint of the mental health care system deep into the community, reaching those before they uh, have some kind of a, a, a crisis and without the need of a diagnosis to support people who are struggling with their mental health. I'm going to end now uh, by just telling you a little bit about what, I, what, what, what my current program is focusing on. My, my current program is focusing on uh, examining how we can scale up these evidence-based approaches uh, to, to addressing both prevention and care for mental health problems. Uh, these are obviously psychosocial interventions, and they really are a realization, uh, aim to be a realization of my, of my goal of mental health for all by all. This is, of course, a great country to be speaking about this, because it's probably a country unlike any other, which has uh, done remarkably well in scaling up access to psychological treatments, which is, in a way, for contextually, the correct approach for this country. And I've been certainly very inspired by IAPT. But one of the biggest barriers uh, for scaling up uh, in, in much of the world is the barrier of training and supervision and quality assurance, because the uh, old-fashioned method, of course, has been this, you know, bringing people into a classroom, having an expert, training them. Uh, and given the enormous scale of unmet need, um, this is not going to be a scalable approach for, 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 for really rapidly increasing the coverage of these effective interventions. So with this in mind, and of course fueled heavily by the last two years of, uh, of experience with digital uh, approaches, we launched the Empower program, which is a joint program of Harvard Medical School uh, and Sangat, the NGO that I co-founded in India, a platform that is bringing together a suite of methods and digital tools to enable a workforce to rapidly learn, uh, deliver, and then master evidence-based psychosocial interventions. Our ongoing efforts have already built libraries of different evidence-based interventions, behavioral activation for uh, depression, uh, problem-solving interventions for prevention of uh, mental health problems in adolescents for delivery in school settings, and so on and so forth. And we were delighted that last year the US, which as I mentioned earlier, has the world's largest per capita uh, mental health resource uh, uh, base, and you'd think this would be the last place in the world where they would actually entertain this kind of idea. Um, my team and I won the Lone Star Prize, also the most unlikely state in the US, you think, uh, which is Texas, um, 
the Lone Star Prize was a one-off prize awarded uh, in Texas to transform the life of Texans who were hit by the pandemic. And you can imagine there were all kinds of ideas being put forth from racial harmony to, uh, uh, to water uh, harvesting. Incredibly, the committee selected our bid to address depression in Texans by using community health workers delivering a brief six-session behavioral activation treatment that had been designed for delivery in India but has been re-engineered for delivery in the US. I think perhaps one of the first time that a innovation developed in a developing country has been exported no less to Texas. In conclusion then, I want to end with a message of real hope. The large body of epidemiological and social science on the social determinants of mental health problems. The body of developmental science that explains how environments in the first two decades of life influence brain development and lead ultimately to the emergence of mental health problems. The clinical science that has designed interventions that target psychological and social mechanisms in individuals. And the implementation science on how these interventions can be delivered effectively in very diverse contexts, deploying existing frontline workers. When put together, the, this incredible body of science offers an opportunity to transform our vision of mental health care. Ultimately, this body of science leaves me, and I hope all of you, with a message of hope. That we can move from a nihilistic view about the effectiveness of the knowledge that we have and how we can deploy that knowledge at a population level, to move to a hopeful evidence-based view where a suite of interventions for the prevention and care of mental health problems can be delivered primarily leveraging resources that every community has, social resources and the human resources of people who care for one another. That, in my mind, is the heart of a reimagined journey to recovery, both for our societies that are facing immense challenges in the shadow of the pandemic, but also war and climate change, as well as for the individuals in our society who are currently struggling with their mental health problems. So thank you very much.